Okay, I guess we'll go ahead and get started. Good evening, hello. Um, welcome to the Yale Law School Faculty Book Talk Series. Um, I'm Courtney McAllister. I'm the Electronic Resources Librarian at the Lillian Goldman Law Library. Uh, this evening's book talk is sponsored by the Law Library, the School of Forestry and Environmental Studies, and the Yale Environmental Law Association. Tonight, we're proud to welcome Professor Daniel Esty, Hillhouse Professor of Environmental Law and Policy, with commentary provided by Professor Doug Kaiser, Joseph M. Field Professor of Law. Uh, they will be discussing Professor Esty's new book, A Better Planet, 40 Big Ideas for a Sustainable Future. Um, I'd like to very briefly introduce our two speakers before we get to the main event. Um, Daniel Esty has been a professor at Yale since 1994. He holds a faculty appointments in both Yale's environment and law schools with a secondary appointment at the Yale School of Management. He directs the Yale Center for Environmental Law and Policy and serves on the advisory board of the Center for Business and Environment at Yale, which he founded in 2006. Professor Esty has written and edited 12 books and numerous articles on sustainability and environmental issues. Prior to joining Yale's faculty, he was a senior fellow at the Peterson Institute for International Economics, served in a variety of positions in the U.S. Environment Protection Agency, and practiced law in Washington, D.C. He is an A.B. from Harvard, an M.A. from Oxford, where he was a Rhodes Scholar, and his J.D. is from Yale Law School. Um, Douglas Kaiser is the Joseph M. Field Professor of Law at Yale Law School. Professor Kaiser has published articles on a wide range of environmental law and tort law topics, and is the co-author of two leading case books, the Torts Process and Products Liability Problems in Process. His recent book, Regulating from Nowhere, Environmental Law and the Search for Objectivity, seeks to reinvigorate environmental law and policy by offering novel theoretical insights on cost-benefit analysis, the precautionary principle, and sustainable development. Please join me in welcoming our two distinguished speakers. Thank you very much. Um, Doug, thank you for coming and contributing to what I think is going to be a lively conversation. And in that spirit, I want to just say, um, let's make it a conversation. So if you want to interrupt me, please do. Um, otherwise, I will just give a few minutes of background on this book on um, a better planet, 40 big ideas for a sustainable future. And let me start by saying um, I've contributed one of 40 essays. So it's really a collaborative effort with lots of perspectives. And that was frankly part of the goal. It was to uh, dive into what's needed for a sustainable future, to think about that problem across issues, across disciplines, and frankly, across political perspectives. And I say that um, gathered as we are at a watershed moment, at a critical moment, um, a very big day, a big week, a big month, um, and what promises to be a big year. And. Um, I'm not, of course, speaking of the impeachment vote today, but rather what's going on environmentally. Um, we're at a risk this year of having the US withdraw from the 2015 Paris Climate Change Agreement. We uh, are already seeing a deregulatory agenda unfold in Washington. Uh, just this past week, the important waters of the United States rule has been recast by the Trump administration in a way that would narrow federal protection of water resources. We have seen over the last few months uh, a, a series of rollbacks of regulatory uh, structures that in some cases have been in place for 40 or 50 years. Uh, I think we have seen the uh, supposed war on coal that the Obama administration uh, had undertaken, at least according to some, replaced by a war on California. Um, and we now see a, a whole series of pushbacks on the way California is trying to regulate, particularly in the absence of federal action. And um, I think it's actually sad to see that kind of a debate going on. Because what we are seeing is a debate between, in some cases, deregulation wholesale and without, I don't think, much care and attention to the details of what's worked and what hasn't. Um, and uh, on the other hand, some people clinging to the status quo. We are also this year, 2020, going to celebrate the 50th anniversary of the original 1970 Earth Day. We will celebrate the 50th anniversary of the US Environmental Protection Agency. And all of which I think gives us a, an especially good moment to step back and ask, what is the pathway to a sustainable future? Uh, how do we get from where we are to where we need to be? Uh, recognizing that climate change looms large on the agenda of issues that's not been 
structured in a way for success. Uh, but water issues, waste issues, uh, chemicals issues, all have elements as well. This book offers a range of ways to think differently about environmental protection. Some of the changes that are proposed are about uh, conceptual structures. Some of them are about uh, technologies that maybe were not available when we really launched ourselves into the modern environmental movement um, 50 years ago. And uh, some of them are about uh, process changes. How do we bring people together, uh, particularly across uh, divides? Uh, a great essay in that regard by Brad Gentry, uh, who's a colleague at the Environment School. And I guess more broadly, uh, there are some big themes that emerge. Uh, a need to recognize that the world looks very different today from the world of the 1970s and 80s when the framework of what particularly the environmental protection law, the pollution control law, uh, first came into being. We at that time didn't have much science to build on. We've got much more. We didn't have uh, agencies that could do anything. We launched a, an EPA to respond. But today I think we have a chance to do much more at the city scale, uh, the state scale, uh, and not rely only on the federal scale. We developed a strategy that was uh, largely around what we now call command and control mandates. Uh, and I think we've got opportunities to do much more with price signals to make people pay for the harm they cause. Uh, 50 years ago, that was unimaginable. We couldn't measure the harm. We couldn't measure the emissions. Uh, so we had to take different approaches. I think we're now prepared, uh, and I think this is going to be a big agenda the next 10 years, to declare, and this is the language of economists, an end of externalities. That is to say, going forward, it uh, need not be the case that you're ever allowed to pollute for free. Uh, you shouldn't be able to send anything up a smokestack or out an effluent pipeline. And by the way, in addition to that, uh, I think companies are going to have to rethink business models that depend on extracting resources from the public domain, whether that be water resources or grazing land or any number of other things. So I think there is a real opportunity to fundamentally change the baseline from which we proceed with our environmental efforts. I think we also might look out and say that the original approach to environmental protection of the 1970s uh, was structured around taking problems apart so we could get our minds around them and arms around them. So air issues, water issues, waste issues, all in separate laws. Uh, we now today have the uh, recognition, and this is uh, perhaps best demonstrated in the essay by Oz Schmitz, the first essay up, that one of the most profound findings of the natural science part of ecology of the last 50 years is how integrated life on this planet is and the need to be much more systems minded. Uh, again, another great essay in the book on systems thinking, systems design by Julie Zimmerman and Paul Anastas. So I think there is a recognition we have to get beyond silos and try to bring things together as opposed to having them fall apart. I also think there's new roles for a lot of the kind of players in the environmental arena, uh, starting with, but not limited to the business community. 1970s, 80s, even into the present moment to some extent, business is seen as the source of problems. Uh, but as we begin to look to a world where there's a need to new, do things in new and different and better ways, uh, and that's my essay, arguing for more innovation in how we do environmental protection. Uh, it turns out we might want to harness the business community as a problem-solving potential and find ways to structure incentives to get the business community to do the things we need done. And I argue that in my own essay called Red Lights to Green Lights with the suggestion that the 20th century approach to environmental protection was largely about telling people what not to do. Stop, red light, don't do that. Uh, and we've now realized that we would benefit by telling people what we need them to do. Just as at an intersection, you don't have just red lights, you have green lights to tell people when to go and where to go. And frankly, some problems have benefited by the red light approach. We have much less in the way of air pollution and water pollution, but other problems, the need to create a clean energy future, to innovate in how we drive the energy foundations of society, have not benefited from that red light approach. We need a more structured set of incentives to engage people in figuring out how to create a clean and renewable energy. Uh, I think we also now recognize the role of the individual has changed. 50 years ago, I think most people thought of themselves as largely um, environmentally minded as voters, uh, stepping up to vote for environmental action. 
Today, I think we recognize that our individuals are acting environmentally as consumers, um, as investors, a growing interest in sustainable finance, sustainable investing, and in the environmental, social, and governance, or ESG metrics that we can apply to companies to understand who's helping to bring us to a sustainable future, who's pulling us away from one. Individuals are also today watchdogs. Everyone with a smartphone is a potential capturer of bad environmental behavior, and putting it up on social media can bring a firestorm of critique to companies that are misbehaving. Uh, I also think we're seeing a, a set of new strategies emerge, a changed view of where problems are gonna be solved in terms of answers. Uh, I think we're at the dawn of this year, of a year of focus moving towards a more circular economy, closed loop. Uh, I think we're gonna have a, a big push over the coming year and really over the coming decade to move our society towards zero waste, which by the way is one of the implications of no externalities. And if you have to pay for the harm you cause, pay for whatever emissions you're doing, you're gonna head for a no emissions world. And I think that's gonna apply even more quickly in the world literally of waste, perhaps starting with packaging waste where there's already a big blowback on single-use plastics. And I think you're gonna see, and the School of Forestry and Environmental Studies on the other side of the campus may help lead the charge here, that there's a big opportunity to move from petroleum-based plastics packaging to fiber-based paper and cardboard packaging. And I think that could be one of the trends that moves us in a more sustainable direction, particularly insofar as those fiber products are much more easily reused, recycled, or composted at the end of life in a more closed loop way. So I think the changes are coming in, uh, in those regards. And again, this year is gonna be, I think, a big one as those uh, pushes in new directions gain momentum. I think we also are seeing, and this book has a number of essays that push this agenda, uh, the value of new kinds of communication. Tony Lyserowitz does a lot of work on how to talk about climate change. Turns out the words we use, the way we engage with science, uh, has been not always that effective in getting people to understand a problem and move on it, uh, a topic I think Doug will talk to in a moment. Another essay which I really like, and as the editor of a collection of 40 essays, I'm not allowed to have a favorite essay, just as no parent can have a favorite child. Um, but I draw special attention to the essay by Thomas Easley called Hip Hop Sustainability which I think makes a really important point about the need to engage those who have felt left out of the environmental conversation on terms that meet their own needs and are in their own language, as opposed to expecting them to come to the conversation that environmentalists have traditionally convened uh, and that is conducted in environmentalist language. So I think the uh, idea of how we talk about problems, how we launch a conversation, how we move to address um, and this is another critical point, issues that may have been left out, uh, principles that may have been ignored, uh, environmental justice being a great example. Uh, who not only is paying for our efforts to address problems, but frankly, even more importantly, who pays for problems left, left unaddressed? Who pays the price for air pollution in our cities, water that's contaminated? Or, and again, I hope Doug will raise this, who pays the price for climate change that's unabated? And I think that environmental justice, of course, has issues related to disadvantaged communities, but also a profound intergenerational dimension that has become very prominent in the past year, uh, perhaps emblematic of that being the naming of Greta as Time's Person of the Year. Uh, but I think more broadly, the school strikes and the rise of a world of young people that are very concerned about environment broadly, sustainability is a core value of society, and of action on climate change. So I'll close by saying I think there are reasons to be somewhat pessimistic. The current policy frame in Washington is not very constructive, but I think there's also reasons to be optimistic. Uh, we have technologies available today, big data, uh, the capacity to use advanced statistics to find problems, look for solutions, compare alternatives, and to do so in ways that were unimaginable a decade or certainly two ago. Uh, we have genomics that may help us to understand individual susceptibility to pollution harm and may allow us to protect people in much better ways. 
Uh, I think there's a lot of potential to create e-government approaches that engage people more fully in a conversation around environmental protection. And I think we've got, even more broadly, a recognition of how important innovation is going to be, uh, the need to do things in new and different and better ways. So I am, uh, at the same moment as I look at Washington with some uh, sadness and disappointment, optimistic by the breakthroughs that are going on across the country and around the world, at the city scale, the state scale, in companies, in laboratories, in universities. And I think that the uh, moment is right for a conversation, not about the politics of the environment, which I think is going to remain fraught, but around the substance of the path to an environmentally more secure future and of a real push for a sustainable future. So with that, let me pause and invite Doug to comment, and then we'll um, pick up what I hope will be a, a conversation back and forth. So thank you all. Um, so I want to thank Courtney and the sponsors of this event for including me. I'm delighted to have an opportunity to engage with Dan and with the remarkable assemblage of ideas and authors that this book represents. Um, students who've taken classes with both of us know that Dan and I tend to approach environmental law from different perspectives. Uh, he is, I think, constitutionally an optimist. Um, he generally sees the cup half full. I tend to be a little more downbeat, tend to see it half empty. Um, what's helpful to note is that we're actually both still right. Um, it's, it's just simple math. Um, and I think that's why we can get along so well, despite the fact that I am Dougie Downer and Dan is um, sort of, I affectionately think of him as the energizer bunny of the environmental <laughs> movement. So um, before I discuss the contribution of the volume, uh, I just want to, I, I want to put us uh, in mind of the context and, and the seriousness of the context, um, the predicament we're in, how long we've struggled to address it. So scientists have long understood that the addition of carbon dioxide, uh, the principal greenhouse gas that's emitted through human activities in the atmosphere will lead to a warming of the earth. This has been known for a long time. Perhaps the earliest experimental demonstration of this effect is from 1856. In 1856, in the American Journal of Science and Arts, an experiment was reported that had been conducted by Eunice Newton Foote. She was a scientist and inventor, a women's rights advocate based in Seneca Falls, New York. She read her, well, actually her findings were read before the American Association for the Advancement of Science at their annual meeting. Historians think they were read not by her, but by a male colleague because women weren't allowed to present scientific findings at the association. The title was Circumstances Affecting the Heat of the Sun's Rays. The study of sunlight's effect on different compositions of gases sealed in vacuum tubes unequivocally demonstrated that increases of carbon dioxide in the air would increase the Earth's temperature. Now, again, that was 1856. Today, in the year 2020, it's not disputed that carbon dioxide concentrations have been inexorably rising. It's not disputed that that rise is linked to human activities. It's not disputed that the climate has been warming and uh, that the bulk of that warming is attributable to human activities, particularly in the so-called Great Acceleration following World War II. Now, unlike most discussions of climate science and policy, um, this slide puts our current predicament in the context of the long history of the planet. So paleoclimate scientists use ice core samples and other methods of reconstructing the Earth's atmosphere and temperature at various points in the planet's history. And they're going back upwards of 400 million years. And what they learn is that we're currently at a level of CO2 concentrations that haven't been seen on the planet for probably 3 million years since before we emerged as a separate species. At that time, three million years ago, sea levels were around 50 feet higher than they are today. On our current trajectory, by 2050, we might hit a level of CO2 not seen for approximately 50 million years, back to a time when trees, palm trees grew in Alaska and crocodile-like creatures were seen in the Arctic. 
if we went on for another century or so at business as usual rates, we'd have to look back some 200 to 400 million years to find an analogous period in our planetary history. 250 million years ago was a time period known as the end Permian Great Extinction, when geologically dramatic and rapid increases in greenhouse gas concentrations triggered changes that killed off more than 96% of life in the oceans and 70% of life on land. Now, those are grim facts. I'm about to make them even worse. Scientists also have long urged the world to appreciate that within the Earth system exist tipping points that must be reckoned with, even though they're difficult to predict and difficult to model with the kind of uh, neat tidiness sought by policymakers. So, for example, a tipping point we're all somewhat aware of, the Amazon rainforest, which contains literally billions of tons of carbon sequestered in trees and other plant life. To understand the Amazon, you need to understand that a single drop of water evaporates and re-precipitates numerous times as it travels through the course of the river, bathing that ecosystem with moisture. It is said that trees in the Amazon make their own rain. But with enough increase in temperature or enough deforestation due to fires and logging, the water will escape from that cycle and the system will rapidly tip from wet rainforest to dry savanna, releasing in the process those billions of tons of sequestered carbon, which in turn will enhance climate change even further. We've also begun seeing worrying signs that the vast amounts of methane that are stored in Arctic permafrost or submerged within frozen hydrates in Arctic waters are becoming destabilized and are beginning to release into the atmosphere. Like the loss of carbon stored in the Amazon, the release of methane from a thawing Arctic is a tipping point scenario that keeps scientists awake at night. From the lawyer's perspective, what makes these tipping points so worrisome is that they represent sources of greenhouse gas emissions that we cannot regulate. Even if we wave a magic wand and somehow decarbonize the economy globally tomorrow, we won't be able to stop the Amazon and stop the melting Arctic from being their own sources of greenhouse gas emissions. But because these tipping points are uncertain and nonlinear and just kind of hard to get our heads wrapped around, they are typically not included within official projections distributed for policymakers and public consumption. So the upshot, though, is clear. It's later than we think. Because of the extraordinary inertia and nonlinearity of the climate system, we are entering unchartered territory. No matter what choices we make from this moment on, we are sledding on melting ice. And for the foreseeable future, we don't know whether the ice will break beneath us. You see why they call me Dougie Downer? <laughs> OK. Now, into this terrifying space comes a really hope-inspiring book that, as I said, is filled with great, thoughtful, rigorous, implementable ideas. Um, and I, if you haven't picked up a copy or checked it out from the library, I encourage you to do so. It's a very carefully curated group of experts from many different disciplines covering different kinds of approaches and bites at the many different ecological problems we're facing, of which climate change is just one. And the essays are short, they're digestible, and they're also just, they're sort of pathways in to deeper literatures, which all lie behind the carefully curated essays. Um, they also nicely showcase um, Yale's strengths in these areas, because quite a few of the authors are Yale um, faculty or affiliates. Um, I want to do something now, just in the, in the short time, to set up a, a little kind of collective um, soul searching for us. Um, and I really, I, I mean this uh, partly just for my own therapeutic purposes. This is something I'm deeply worried about. And I think, I think Professor Esty um, is as well. Uh, he seemed to allude to, he seemed to know where I was going to be going. <laughs> We've been around to each other too long. Um, 
So here's a little concept map, and it's um, in in extremely kind of stylized and reductionist. I'm nervous to see Professor Markovitz in the back of the room because there's no deeper and clearer thinker uh, uh, on the planet than Professor Markovitz, but I'm gonna do this anyways, all right? So, so if we think, if we have some sort of map of, of social change, um, and we think about where we wanna try to put our interventions, put our human resources, our, our lives, our careers, if we're here in this room, we're probably motivated by the environmental crisis. We want to see a sustainable future. Where do we think we can have the most efficacy as agents of social change? If you think about a spectrum of sort of law on one side, society on another side, and of course, this is reductionist, these things are co-constitutive, you can't have law without society, you can't have society without laws. But we nonetheless think this way, right? So we think of the market and religion and family and the private sector, a lot of things we think over in society. And then in law, we think about agencies and courts and rules and, and we think in those terms, even though they are co-constitutive. And you can imagine a kind of spectrum of, if I wanna be an agent trying to change and, and, and put about a more sustainable future, do I wanna go work for Tesla and make sure that it takes over the auto industry? Or do I wanna to, to go work for the EPA and restore its authority as a sustainable thought leader and implementer? Where do I wanna be? And then if, in terms of intervening in these spaces, do I intervene with a strategy of science and reason and empiricism to try to persuade through logic and evidence? Or do I try to rely on power of some sort, economic power, political power, the power of music, imagination, art, what is it that causes social change to happen in the world? And, you know, Mass v. EPA was right up here where the Yale Law School feels most comfortable, right? <laughs> Using our, our legal briefs to persuade officialdom to announce we need to change the world. Tell EPA you've got to go solve climate change. Here's Al Gore, you can't see him, he's, he's in that goofy hydraulic thing that lifted him up on the <laughs> hockey stick chart. But in Inconvenient Truth, which helped earn Al Gore the Nobel Prize, was trying to affect society, but in the most techie, wonky, enlightenment style, reason, science, empiricism way you could imagine possible. Here's uh, Robert Murray, the head of a coal company, who literally is hugging Rick Perry as he's just handed over the text of FERC coal bailout regulations that he wants Perry to pass. Um, thank goodness that's an independent agency and we've been able to block it so far. But this is not reason and power, this is not like persuasive appeals to reason here, this is just raw capture, raw capture. And the photographer who took this picture lost his job. And then we've got mass mobilization, which is a form of power. And it's a form of power that, you know, Greta's an amazing figure because when she speaks, she speaks in the vernacular of reason. She simply adopts what the scientists have said in the official reports. But her power is, is a different kind of power. It's a kind of charisma that, you know, that, that first photo of the, the early Friday strikes where it's her with her humble cardboard sign and her raincoat and that, there's charisma in that commitment that wasn't this kind of charisma. So we gotta ask ourselves, you know, what's gonna cause the change we need to see? And I went through this afternoon and it was just very, very rough. Um, this is just really for illustrative purposes. But I tried to map the chapters. Of where would they fall, right? Where would they fall on this diagram if we accept this is a kind of somewhat useful heuristic. And here we go, here's my tally. We've got a bunch up here in, we'll call it the Yale zone. Um, <laughs> and then to Professor Estes' credit, um, he, he's had many, many chapters in, in his career, one of which was being one of the first people early on to see the power of the private sector, to the, see the power of corporate social responsibility as a motivator that exists above and beyond what law is requiring. So I would put a lot of the chapters over here, looking at technology, innovation, enlightened self-interest by forward-thinking companies, and so on. And then 
Then I found three that I would put here. And two uh, were mentioned by Professor Esty, Tony Lasarowitz's piece on climate communication and the hip hop forestry piece. Um, I'd also put John Grimm and Mary Evelyn Tucker's piece on religious and ecological faith communities. Um, and so the question I would raise for us, and this is the soul searching I think we all have to do, is, um, you know, does Yale University, does do the big green environmental organizations, does the Democratic Party, do we need to reallocate some of our resources into these other boxes, which seem so mysterious and hard to model and hard to study, and yet at the end of the day might be the things that are actually necessary to change the world. Um, and I want to plug another book by Dan, uh, co-edited with Marianne Chertow over at the Forestry School from 96, 97, which was similarly based on a series of like high-level thought leader conferences and then led to a really powerful editing collection. And that was 96, 97. And then in the meantime, we haven't had the progress we need from the perspective of environmental sustainability. So like, I, I'm literally trying to use this for my own therapy, right? Do we all need a different career? Do we need to redefine the career, the role of the academy? the role of environmental advocacy. I put it out there for 